depending. Uh, I would like to welcome you all to our November virtual event. My name is Jennifer Northam. I'm a member of the class of 1991, and I've been part of the alumni team for the last seven years. We are thrilled to have alumna author Katie Schultz joining us today. Uh, she'll be sharing work from her two award-winning books and talk about the two very different writing styles that she used. We'll have the opportunity to ask questions on screen when Katie has finished her presentation. Uh, feel free to turn on your cameras. Uh, and uh, I know that Katie enjoys being able to see who she's speaking to. Uh, but please note this event is being recorded and we'll um, share it on the college YouTube page. So folks who aren't able to attend will be able to enjoy the program anyway. It is now my pleasure to introduce Katie Schultz. She is a graduate of the class 2001 and the author of Flashes of War, which the Daily Beast praised as an ambitious and fearless collection and Still Come Home, a novel both published by Loyola University, Maryland. Honors for her work include the Linda Flowers Literary Award, Doris Betts Fiction Prize, Forward Indies Book of the Year for both titles, gold and silver medals from the Military Writers Society of America, five Pushcart nominations, a nomination to Best American Short Stories, National Indies Excellence Finalist Recognition, and Writing Fellowships in eight states. She was also recently named a finalist in the Chicago Writers Association Book of the Year Awards for Still Come Home. She lives in Silo, North Carolina, and is the founder of Maximum Impact, a transformative mentoring service for creative writers that's been recognized by both CNBC and the What Works Network. Katie, welcome to our virtual program. Hi, thank you so much. It's really wonderful to see some familiar faces and names and some new. Thank you for being here. <clears throat> So Jennifer, thank you so much too for just emailing with me and helping me curate what I have to offer this evening. Um, I do this a lot in my life and in my work and I'm often not nervous, but I'm a little nervous this evening because I care so very much about <laughs> Whitman people. Um, so I take that as a good sign, even though so several decades have passed. Um, and I wouldn't, I do want to mention um, some of the things I'm going to touch on tonight are really directly come out of the four years I had at Whit Whitman studying with Hosh, um, Professor Hashimoto, and the philosophy department, especially um, Tom Davis, and what we did in um, studying the Socratic dialogue. So I'm excited to geek out about that a little with you guys. I don't get to go um, that deep that direction too often, but I know that I can do that here. Um, so we'll do a little mix of uh, some craft talk and informing about sort of um, what I do or maybe how I ended up doing what I do. <laughs> and then I'll read a bit. And I know from Jennifer that we're gonna have plenty of time for conversation at the end. I also wanted to give a nod to um, a wonderful semester that I had sophomore year living in the writing house. The interest houses were pretty new. I think it was only the second time a group of writers had been accepted into the writing house at that time. And um, that was really formative and fun. So the first uh, thing I want to offer you is just a description of flash fiction. Um, it's a little hard with not everyone on camera, but just those of you that I can see, if you've heard of that, I'd love to see if you've heard, if you're familiar with that. Okay. And how many of you identify as writers? Also curious about that. Oh, great. Okay. That's helpful. Um, so flash fiction, and this also is, happens in nonfiction, can very easily just quickly be described as like a work of art carved on a grain of sand. So tiny, tiny moments um, and they're short, short pieces. So 250 to 750 words of creative writing, which is basically like one to three pages, double spaced. 
that's sort of where I got my sea legs in the fiction world, if you will, although my graduate degree was in creative nonfiction. And what I was really drawn to about this form, I mean, first of all, there's a lot of space to play with language and that definitely felt interesting to me as the philosophy, former philosophy major or undergraduate major. But also what these characters are forced to do is react in the moment with really diminished resources. Cause you only have like one to three pages to get the job done. And so there's no need to like, explain the character's life story. You just get in and get out and get it over with and make an impression. So that's that for me was very freeing as a writer um, and attractive because I feel like, <laughs> um, I feel like I live in a world of diminished resources. I mean, I, I'm very fortunate and resourced, but when I look at the planet, for example, um, I think about diminished resources. Uh, so that was sort of a intellectual space that I could tap into pretty readily. These stories have a lot of names. They're sometimes called vest pocket stories because they're like tiny enough that you could fit them in your pocket. Um, historically, they've sometimes been called palm of hand stories or a smoke long quarter, a smoke long story, like about as long as it would take a person to smoke a cigarette is about as long as it would take to read one story. Um, that's all fun. It's really about sort of the length and what you do with making an impact. And uh, for those of you interested too in sort of how the imagination works and intersects across different media, media flash, really its roots can be traced back to like ancient woodblock carvings which are, if you think about it, many of them were just a snapshot, right? Just a, um, just a moment in time captured, but they evoke so much. A successful woodblock carving or print made from it can um, suggest an entire lifetime. So in some ways, these uh, flash fiction stories are trying to do just that as well. So I'm gonna read a few from my first book, uh, which came out in 2013. It's called Flashes of War and I'm gonna stand. Um, and it's mostly flash fiction. There are some full length stories in here, but I was, uh, the, all of the characters um, featured in this book are on all sides of the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan. And I'm not a veteran, uh, and I don't come from a military family and I um, have never been to the Middle East. So there were a lot of creative and imaginative leaps I had to take. Uh, and so it was helpful to write short. <laughs> As I tell people, it took like six months to make sure my characters were dressed right, you know, or like holding the right weapons or standing in a believable ecosystem. And then like six more months to make them like walk and talk right. And then like another year to actually like have them complete a moment of their fictional lives that was believable. <laughs> so I really was, um, to me, I felt like world building in the same way that you might hear a fantasy writer describe world building. Um, like I would have been easier to put penguins on Mars, but instead I decided to put soldiers in Afghanistan. <laughs> so here's a few, this is the, um, this is the first flash in Flashes of War, it's called While the Rest of America's at the Mall. It's not quite sniper fire, but it isn't random either. The Hajis so much as hear me think, and they start gunning the water from their position on the bridge, bullets raining like a Carolina downpour. They can't see me in the dark, so I toss a balled up t-shirt far as I can toward enemy fire to mess with their thinking. They aim right for it, the shirt lurching like a live wire while I dip underwater and start swimming the opposite direction. By the time I've crawled up the banks of the Darya Yikonar and radioed the airstrike on their exact location, the Hajis are still standing there, shooting that shirt all the way to the Indus River. Dark swimming is my gig this tour, Navy SEALs. You'd never believe me, but the underwater night goggles make this place look like the tropics. 
Bullets glitter through the water in slow-mo. Little Hershey's kisses moving in silver arcs, the way I remember Savannah tossing them to me on her fourth birthday. It's raining kisses, Daddy, she sang. She made up the tune, and it's almost a joke now trying to think of the last time I made up a song for no particular reason. Any second now, that bridge will sizzle, and Spalding will crack some joke about the Konar looking more like Haji soup. Then LT will pluck that damn tea tree toothpick out of his mouth and nod and say, good work, son. So corny it could be from the movies, and I wish this was all of us busting drug convoys 50 clicks north of Kabul, while the rest of America's at the mall. With the burqa. With the burqa, it was like this. The world came at me in apparitions, every figure textured by the mesh filter in front of my eyes. In a city with so much death, it was easy to believe half of the people I saw were ghosts. Women sat like forgotten boulders along the sidewalks in Kabul. We begged, we prayed. Now wearing the burqa is a choice. Without it, the sun is so bright that when I walk, it feels like swimming through sticky yellow air. I can see clearly, but there's nothing left of my city to look at. A missile that didn't detonate sleeps like a gigantic baby in my garden, cradled in a 10 foot crater of dirt and rubble. There used to be a brick wall around my family's home. My father built that wall. Now my father is gone and the wall is gone and even the tools for restoring the wall have been looted from our doorstep. One night, I dream that the missile takes root. The garden groans and stretches, growing rounds of ammunition and grenades. In the dream, the entire neighborhood comes to harvest from my weapons cache. I wander through the rows of weaponry, tugging bullets by their brass tips. They fall into my palms like succulent berries. The grenades are more difficult, but my touch is soft. I set them in my satchel like fresh eggs and carry them to the market where servicemen from the base are having a holiday. They come to my booth reluctantly at first, then hungrily when they realize the weapons have grown from the earth. Here's a bullet for the sergeant who pestered my children in the middle of the night. A handful for his team members, the way they looked at us like something to be pitied. And the grenades, those are for the pilot who dropped the missile on my house. Watch how trustingly he takes the satchel, hugging it like a new parent. When everything is sold, I leave the market and slowly walk home. I hear the pop and whir of bullets first, then the grenades explode. I don't have to turn around to see what disaster looks like. When I wake, the sun is a ball of flame arcing over my city. There's no escape from its heat. I reach for my burqa and cover myself once more. It's damp and dark in here, just like the grave where my father's bones have turned to dust. You may come, you may come in very briefly. Good night. Good night. I love you so. Sweet talks. Okay, have a good dream. I see Papa. Yeah, Papa is there, yeah. <laughs> good night, sweetie. Um, boy, would it be would have been nice to have that little upbeat interlude on book tour. <laughs> um one more, one more. Here. This is called Pooh Mission. First squad was bedded down inside a firm house in Fallujah, our worst day of fighting and more casualties than we even knew at that point. But the block was secure and we had men on watch from rooftop to sidewalk. I had to take a dump and the only safe place was the building we were sleeping in. I elbowed my buddy on the floor next to me. Yo, Holden, you awake? 
I'm either awake or I'm dead. I gotta take a shit. Right away, Holden made a big deal of the whole thing. Friars on a poo mission, he announced. Most of the guys were awake anyway, a chorus of chuckles erupting from the moonlit room. Ruiz said, he's dropping the kids off at the pool. Caldwell said, he's taking the Browns to the Super Bowl. Fitz said, he's prairie dogging it. Yeah, yeah, and all your moms can't wait to watch me do it, I told them. We got up and Holden followed me down the dark hallway, broken glass and busted rocks crunching beneath our boots. My ears were ringing, but other than that, the city sounded eerily quiet. I didn't like it one bit. We reached the end of the hall and saw three doors all shot up. Go in the middle one, Holden said. That's where the dead mooch is. Hell no, I said. I don't want any mooch watching me take a dump dead or alive. I chose the entrance on the left and walked into the room. The whole place felt like a haunted house with bad juju. Only hours beforehand, this room held a weapons cache for the terrorists trying to keep a stronghold in the city. There weren't any windows, so I clicked on my headlamp and cleared a place to squat. Bullet shells, hypodermic needles, and busted chairs littered the floor. A rug lay in the corner, stained with blood. Holden waited for me on the other side of the door. After a few minutes, I heard him light a cigarette. Hey, Friar, he said. What? If we make it back, don't tell Maria about the smoking, okay? He meant if we make it back to Bozeman, where we're both from. We still had two months. Man, she should just be happy you're alive, I said. Try telling her that, he said. It's being pregnant. She's fussy now. I pulled my pants back up and joined him in the hallway. In that case, I said, you better let me help you with those, for your health and all. He smiled and tossed me a smoke. When we got back to the main room, most of the guys were asleep. I could hear Ruiz snoring, and right next to him lay Sergeant Fisher, twitching away in some sort of half-sleep. It's an odd thing seeing your squad so vulnerable like that. They almost look like strangers, my brothers, my fellow Marines. The way the moon cast a blue light across their bodies, it made them look holy. More than anything, it made them look dead. So how does this happen? <laughs> it really started for me with an inquiry into language. So you heard in those pieces words like haji, right? Infidel. Um, and then also I think everyone here those that I can see at least guessing ages. We, we've been at war for so long, for 20 years since 9-11. And um, so I was really terrified by, um, at first after 9-11, the, the rapid sort of dismantling of language, patriot, terrorist, mission accomplished how we could take a word and just turn it upside down and entire trains of thought and entire ideologies and entire societies could sort of um, be, be remade or, or dismantled, you know, as a trickle down effect of the abuse of one word. It's, it, it felt like um, telling a painter one day that red isn't red anymore, red is green. <laughs> and the painter would certainly have something to say about that. And I felt like that was happening to language. And I, I didn't even at that point I identify as a writer in the early 2000s. Um, certainly never thought I'd be able to make a career of it. But I was watching this and feeling this and really unsettled about how to respond. So I did um, teach middle school for a while and uh, work on a sort of living uh, farm at a boarding school, the Arthur Morgan School. That to me felt like a way to sort of be on the front lines in a way that aligned with my personality. I'm not an external front lines protester activist. I'm a quieter, um, slower <laughs> individual. Uh, I, I try to find ways to engage in 
change that maybe are less tangible, um, maybe that can't even be photographed. And, and I found that in working with teens for a while, um, but I still um, had that unsettled feeling about language, right? And so uh, I was able to work with that through my studies in graduate school and leaning really heavily on what I had learned at Whitman, which is, which is really this. So when I looked at what didn't sit with me with those use of the, the use of those words, um, what was happening was I was being sort of continually brought to this moment of disconnect where I just was sort of shell-shocked or frozen. Like, like how do you even begin a conversation <laughs> um, when someone thinks that like calling someone else a haji is an insult when in fact, like its intent is originally, you know, to be like a compliment. <laughs> um, like where, where does conversation even begin? So I would just be sort of frozen. And I began to research these wars and I'm also very visual. Stories always come to me either through cadence, like I can hear the syllables and then I can fill in the sentence based on the, the pace of the syllables or I can see um, an image in my mind's eye that, that freezes me. And so their war as it just so happens is full of these kinds of images. And I'm not talking about gruesome images. That's a different kind of frozen. This was, that's a shocking frozen. This was like a, a heart centered frozen. <laughs> so like I was watching a documentary called Kandahar in my early stages of research, still not knowing if I could, what I was doing, if I could even do what I was doing. Um, and there was this one part of the video where um, there were some men at a refugee camp and they all were missing one leg and they had crutches and were being cared for to minimally. And um, you hear this noise in the distance and then they're all looking up. Suddenly they're all looking up at the sky and you see there's a plane coming and they take off like full speed on crutches, you know, across the desert towards this plane and then the plane opens its hatch and it drops down on parachutes, prosthetic legs. And the men are racing towards the prosthetic legs. So, I mean, I paused the DVD, but then like, what do you do? Like, what do you do with that? There were no words, right? <laughs> so, um, I was able to see through really repeating that process of bringing myself to a place of disconnect over and over that this was a actually a familiar intellectual space for me because in ancient modern, which was like one of the required classes for philosophy major at Whitman, um, one of the things we worked with in great de detail with Professor Tom Davis was um, the Socratic dialogue. And so just like super briefly, you might have um, Socrates engaging a warrior in conversation. And this warrior has gone to battle, has shaped his life around what it means to be a courageous individual. And so Socrates would naturally engage the warrior in a conversation. Well, what does courage mean? Well, what does courage actually mean? And through conversation, um, Socrates would bring this warrior to a moment of disconnect when in, the, in, this, in this case, they were all men, um, when he had to either accept that he didn't actually know what courage meant. And by accepting that he didn't actually know who he was as an individual, or he could just sort of close back up and walk away and try to live in ignorance again. <laughs> so it's really the death of oneself and the birth of another. And um, lest we think this isn't a big deal, you know, eventually it became a life and death matter, right? <laughs> uh, people were killed for this kind of intellectual blasphemy. Uh, so What I was interested in doing or what that flash form, which I talked about at the opening of this evening, enabled me to do was to focus just on that moment of disconnect. Because I feel like when we're faced with that, real life or fiction, where you're put into the situation where say you could maybe do everything right and still be wrong, like 
our next, what we do next is perhaps our most authentic action, like in our whole lives. And that's, and the accumulation of those moments is a life lived. That's for the novel. <laughs> and you get, you know, moments and moments, chapter after chapter, but in flash, you just have really just that one moment. So what's gonna happen on the other side of it? And it doesn't matter too much what came before. And it doesn't matter too much what's gonna come next. In Flash, you just get to hone in on that moment, like that pulse, right? Um, Charles Baxter says that the novel can win you by points, but Flash has to win you by TKO, right? It just has to like knock you in the face. Whereas the novel is really that charting that prolonged moral decision. Um, so slowly but surely, I was able to sort of see how really that class, <laughs> that one class gave me the foundation to like write from a place of discomfort and unknown and toward discovery. Um, and that really saved me from having to have fears about um, writing a political book, which I didn't want to write. I mean, all art is political. That's like a whole other webinar, but like, I didn't want to take sides with this book. And, and thankfully people, uh, were able to engage with it in that way. Um, because I was able to write from that space of disconnect toward something that felt true, emotionally true. Um, I also um, did not have to really, I didn't get thrown to the wolves, for example, all kinds of things, what being white, middle-class privilege, a woman, a civilian, <laughs> living in the country that was the aggressor. I mean, all kinds of things, like all kinds of things could have gone wrong. <laughs> and thankfully they didn't. And thankfully I didn't actually like know just how wrong things could have gone while I was in the early drafting stages. Otherwise I might've, who knows. But um, I really think that that foundation with language uh, helped, helped lead the way for me. So I promised I would shift gears a little too and talk a little bit about how you go from writing short and then writing long because that was really an education for me as well. Like I, my home is really those short, short pieces that you just heard. Um, so how do you do it? You know, I had, I had done the research in terms of the wars and all of that was still in me. There were three characters um, from the first book that sort of still haunted me. And um, in 2012, I somehow, I, I just had this image in my mind's eye that appeared of these three characters meeting in the middle of a road. And um, the image was so clear to me, it was almost like it had, it was a photo from my own family photo albums. Like I just knew it like intimately, I knew it and I, I believed in its absolute authenticity. I have no idea where it came from other than that these three characters had you know, previously been invented in the other book. Um, and this book wasn't even published then. <laughs> So it was really huge leap of faith because I didn't even know anything would happen. But um, I started writing my way toward that moment. And I mean, it was a disaster. I didn't know what I was doing. Like, how do you like, like, how do writers do that? How do you like keep going when you spent like, especially when you spend three years trying to say less <laughs> and then you have to all of a sudden say more. Like I had to force myself to use the word that. <laughs> <laughs> and had sometimes. Um, so I did still have to research, but it wasn't research about the wars um, or about 21st century fighting tactics um, or about um, the presence of the Taliban in different provinces at different points in time in the last 20 years. That work had already been done. I had to research really beautiful sentences and, and, and strings of them. How did one sentence, as a uh, friend and mentor Jack Driscoll says, one sentence announces the possibility of the next. How, 
How does one sentence open the door for the next one? Um, I have my work cut out for me with that. And really I learned a lot of that by drafting, just amassing the pages, many of them horrible. This is just what we do. This is just a fact of our writing lives. Um, the amassed, amassed horrible pages. If I could pivot my, see, I have, I've actually saved some of the horrible pages, but um, so there was that work, which I was doing sort of on the page in real time. And then simultaneously I was on tour for Flashes of War and the United States Air Force Academy read the book and I, and flew me out there and it was like unbelievable. Just, it was like visiting another planet. It was truly amazing and overwhelming. I mean, I had to be escorted everywhere, like including meals. So I often prefer to eat like, maybe this was before I had a child, like maybe not talking to people while I eat, maybe reading. And I had, you know, here I was like um, honored with various Air Force members presence at every single meal for four days straight. Like I, they did let me go on a run alone, but there were cameras everywhere. Um, so during one of those conversations, it struck me that uh, one of the gentlemen I was speaking with, you know, had spent his entire career learning to fly. Um, I, I don't even know the name of it anymore the big helicopters, like the big ones, the helicopters like that like carry vehicles. And he flew dark, so he flew at night, unlit, back and forth, back and forth, back and forth, delivering pallets of money, American cash. This is, and, and when he shared this with me, I mean, everyone tried to be so, so neutral, but I could sort of hear in there like, like really? Like I risked my life for that? And I, and I never forgot it, right? And this is the same person who like showed me a picture of his wife and kids like that, like that's what he was doing. So I had that experience. I was researching, writing sentences. And then a, around that time, I found an article that was first pub, published in The Nation way back in 2009, but I found this like in 2013 or 14 um, that detailed the practice of host nation trucking. So just very briefly, um, you know, so we have Ford operating bases all over the world, and especially in Afghanistan and Iraq, many of them are being dismantled right now, but there are plenty, still plenty there. And we have to get our troops their supplies, like everything from toilet paper to computers that they can look at Facebook on to MREs to weapons. And um, one of the most expedient and actually effective, quote, safe ways to do that is you know, not to like ship American semis over there and American drivers over there, but uh, just ship the stuff and at the border hire the host nation, host meaning Afghanistan or host meaning Iraq, hire their trucking companies to deliver the goods the rest of the way. Okay, so we did that and the American dollars paid for that, but to trace where those dollars actually went was actually to discover that in order to get from point A to point B safely, it's not as simple as driving down the interstate like it is here. You have, you have, <laughs> I mean, all kinds of hazards, physical hazards, but also um, totally different cultural circumstances and understanding of cash economy, like totally different. <laughs> and so these, these, truck drivers would say, yes, you know, I can guarantee the delivery of these goods to American troops. End of story, America's done, we've got other things to look at. And in order to do their jobs, they would have to bribe warlords of provinces. They would have to pay off Taliban. The warlords would have to pay off Taliban. And so I started to think about that gentleman I met at the United States Air Force Academy, started to think about going on long and longer sentences, which meant I needed a plot. And I started to think about tracing a dollar to its source and that image of the road. And I knew that that money would be in the middle of that road somehow between those three characters. So once I had that, it was sort of like heart research and sentence research and factual research. Um, I, had, I had plot and then I had like five years and nine drafts to get it right. So. Um, Thank you.
that was quite lengthy, but I'm still ahead of schedule according to my notes for Jennifer. So um, those of you that I can see, I sense that you're still with me. I see some kind nodding faces. So thank you for that. Um, I will say it was very, very hard to, um, to find Afghan voices in particular for the novel, which does take place over the course of three days in a in a, a real, in Orzgan province in Afghanistan, I made up the village that it takes place in, but I can show you exactly where that village would be on the map. I mean, I can tell you which direction is east and west. Um, but there was a book, Kais Akbar Omar's memoir called A Fort of Nine Towers. It has some very, very hard moments, but of all the books I could find of Afghans, you know, their own voices, them speaking, his was one of the few that let me into a family courtyard. Let me see those intimate moments. And that was what I had to find in order to believe that one of my three main, well, two of the, two of the three main characters are Afghan, but in order to believe that I could do it. And what did I discover on the other side of the courtyard wall? Well, that we're not that different from each other in the, in the short answer of it. It wasn't that hard. Yeah, surface details, definitely, you gotta get that right. But heart to heart, they weren't that different. So I felt I could take it on. Um, so my job now is to read a little from the novel, if that's feeling right, or Jennifer, I'm also happy to sort of take a pause. Keep going, okay. Um, Let's do this. These will be pretty brief, five minutes each. Um, I'll introduce you to, so it's three characters and we follow their lives over the course of three days. You know from the beginning that their lives are gonna intersect. You know for me now, their lives are gonna intersect in that road. <laughs> the rest, um, I'll, I'll try to not spoil. Uh, but we'll give a little teaser here from Asaya. And please remember that she's in a burqa, okay? And she is 17 years old and she is disobeying her husband, traveling unaccompanied in the market, just outdoor on foot. There's this little orphan standing around that sort of, helps give her cover, but she's a woman alone, not listening. Go on, she says to the orphan. I need you to buy that book in there and bring it to me. The boy, Gazelle, nods and folds the money into his fist like a wafer. He flees through the shop door, bells ringing as it slams shut behind him. Asaya crosses the street and waits on the corner. It was her fortune to meet Gazelle, it had to be. It's her fortune to have a husband earning money too. If life allows, he'll oblige. Maybe they'll adopt this boy. She would be able to wander freely again. She gazes at the sky, cloudless and anemic blue. Morning doves balance on nearby rooftops. The birds look dull, brown, the same color as the alleys, the side roads, the brick walls that are built and then blasted and then built again between regimes. The same color as the dirt beneath her husband Raheem's fingernails after a day working creek beds. The Americans have been known to hire locals. Maybe they approve of her husband's business. For all she knows, they might have even hired him a crew. She paces alongside the street and pinches her forearms. The morning doves lift in flight and she follows them with her gaze. Silhouetted against the sun's rays, the birds turn black, beautiful, but within seconds, they're swallowed by the sun. She looks past the schoolhouse to the outbuilding in its courtyard. Two short years in there, and she had imagined herself an educated girl. Mrs. Darrow called her to the blackboard for sentence diagramming, and that's when the Taliban had come with their guns. Asaya had squeezed the stick of chalk between her fingers until it broke. That chalk was so expensive, so difficult to come by. Wouldn't Miss Darrow be disappointed? 
Asaya had tried to hide it, but then the fighters were shouting and Miss Darrow put herself between Asaya and them. They struck Miss Darrow across the face with their guns, her hands reaching behind to hold Asaya's shoulders and keep her safe while she took the blows. Mrs. Darrow's headscarf fell to the floor, blonde hair igniting the room like an insult. Then all at once, one of the fighters pressed Mrs. Darrow into the blackboard with Asaya behind her, sandwiched against the wall. Asaya could see the other students' faces, the way they covered their eyes, ashamed to witness. Then the fighter did something with his hands that made Mrs. Darrow shrink. Mrs. Darrow, so special, but Asaya couldn't help her. She could only breathe, her face pressed sideways into the small of Mrs. Darrow's back, and she hadn't smelled real laundry detergent before, but it must have been right for a Western woman. She smelled like flowers, even when that man was doing something, and Asaya felt Mrs. Knee's buckle, her teacher. Her teacher smelled like flowers. 10 hours a week of language lessons. That's how much Asaya had studied before the Taliban banned education for girls again, before the war picked up its mighty pace, before the explosion thrashed her family and likewise all her possessions. Odd, the things she misses. A sequined green dress worn for an older cousin's wedding the way sunlight played off its stitched round discs like the skin of an emblazoned lizard, or her mother's wooden spoon that hedgehogs chewed into one winter, splintering the pulpy wood until its only use could be for Asaya's pretend pots of stew. Each word is a link in the chain, Mrs. Darrow had told her. She never returned after that day with the Taliban, but Asaya treasured the teachings. The more words you have, the longer your chain can be. Asaya hoarded terms voraciously, the end result of vocabulary of two or three hundred words and playground conversation. Ran, run, run, ran, run. Asaya mouths the words now as she waits on the street corner, fingers stuffed into the folds of her elbows, pinching, pinching. I am, you are, she is, we are, they are, I am, I am. Fueled, Asaya rushes back to the window and presses her face against the glass. The shopkeeper's hand, the red dictionary, both of them at once, then both of them gone, out of sight. Asaya stands on her toes, but can see no further into the shop. Let the villagers scorn her for her impatience. Let them throw potatoes. Let them toss her onto the ground. Let them. Right now, there is only this swollen feeling across her body, like so many words trapped within. So that's Asaya, she's 17 and determined. <clears throat> I'm realizing I'm realizing now how much that was also about words. It's a happy accident, individual words, that is. So let's re meet Nathan Miller, who's often just called by his last name, Miller. Um, Let's see how to do this. Page 73. <clears throat> yeah, this one's tricky. <laughs> so this is all you really need to know. He's just received um, a directive from the higher the higher ups, McChrystal, and this is a um, actually verbatim directive that is like you can find this on Google if you go down the rabbit hole long enough, like I did. So this is sort of verbatim this letter that McChrystal sent out. He's just gotten this himself in his fictional position in my novel, and um, it just absolutely puts him over the edge. He is at a breaking point, and this is it. This is the straw that breaks the camel's back. So you're going to. Here, meet him in um, a brief but very rough moment <laughs> for himself. He's just read the email he's sitting at his desk in Afghanistan. Miller swivels on his chair, unlocks a desk drawer, and grabs one bottle of Percocet. Still plenty left, should he need them, though even now, his first time opening one of the prescriptions, he questions his judgment. Three tablets, chewed and swallowed with a quickness, 
the bitter sting a welcome distraction. His Ritalin chaser comes with surprising ease as though Miller is watching someone else's hands do the swift work. The twist and pop, the tapping of pills. He crushes two into powder with the bottom of his stapler. And just like he has seen in movies, at off-base parties back home, on YouTube even, arranges it in lines, and then it's gone. A few minutes, an hour, couldn't be. His mind is so soft, finally, humming white noise and elasticity. First snowfall in a hardwood forest, the daring tracks of rabbits through the powder. First kiss, not his wife Tenley, but a girl named Sandra from art class, permed hair and a quick tongue. First finish line back in his 5K days of blacktop and sprints. First art museum, that traveling Van Gogh exhibit, and he didn't care if it were every other would-be painter's story too. He'd been transfixed. Brush strokes across canvas, across centuries, across his eyelids, and then gone. Blinked away with a signature and National Guard promotions, four tours. First time he didn't stand up for a friend being bullied. First time he broke a girl's heart. First time his daughter Sissy cried, not for nursing, not at vaccines, but at goodbye and goodbye and goodbye and goodbye. To be a father, to be fathered, first spanking. That memory forces Miller from his desk to pace the hallway. Age four, Indiana, in the aftermath of a summer thunderstorm, Nathan walked to the end of his long driveway where dirt met asphalt, two-lane Indiana State Highway 67 stretching for miles. Here, the ground that only ever seemed to give up corn gave up something else, earthworms, droves of them writhing across the blacktop as if in pain. Nathan looked left, looked right. The puddled highway heaved with beautiful, slender creatures that his kindergarten teacher had told him did the most amazing, invisible work underground. He looked left, right again, then left one more time. The big rigs would be coming soon the way they did, dozens of them every hour splashing between one town and the next. The earthworms were helpless in the aftermath of the downpour, turning in circles, already starting to cook as water evaporated from the road. Nathan had wanted to save them, every single one, for show and tell he'd be able to brag about it, explaining how he had done his part to keep the Miller family corn's reputation as best in the county, maybe even best corn in the state. He imagined a vast colony of worms beneath his family's fields, moving through the soil, helping the crops breathe. He named them as he walked down the center of the highway, placing them gently out of harm's way, Morris, Danny, Sean, these names from his cousins that came easily at first, then Scooby, Grover, walk, walk, walk. And then it came. His father's voice like a mad roar, Nathan pulled by the arm, shoulder whipping back as his head snapped like a knot at the end of a rope. Only 50 yards or so from his own driveway, but still over the double yellow line, and my God, boy, you could have been killed. His father, breathless, what were you thinking? And Nathan felt the sentence on the tip of his tongue, that I could save them, daddy. But there wasn't time. Nathan's pants down, bare ass to the sun, a truck blazing past, the whoosh of dust and dirt whipping around them. Was it horns from the semis that rang in his ears or the hurt, the hurt of it, his father's palm, hot and fast, making a point so that Nathan never forgot. No difference really between being held back when he could have saved more earthworms and what these new rules of engagement from McChrystal will bring into reality except these were human lives, limbs that didn't regenerate when cut in two, families that didn't regenerate either. So that's Nathan at his worst, <laughs> nearly. <laughs> I'm sorry for that. Um, excerpts are really tricky from longer works. And there's a third character, Raheem. It's Asaya's husband. He um, sort of unwillingly works for the Taliban. And I will let you meet him on your own. He has his own sort of way of being on the page. Uh, so that's really what I have to offer. I know that, I, well, I have a few other directions I can go. Um, 
but I know we also have time just for conversation and whatnot. Um, and I thank you so much for your kind attention thus far. Katie, thank you so much. The imagery is so vivid. It's, I feel transported. If there is anyone who would like to uh, ask a question, I see some uh, some of the reactions with some uh, clapping and thumbs up for you, Katie. Bruce. Yes, thank you, Jennifer. Absolutely. Hi, Katie. Hi. Um, the first story, which I'm familiar with and have always loved, the last line. I think it's while the rest of America is shopping at the mall, or 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 close to that. Um, that is really a TKO of TKOs when you said uh, that's what Flash aims for. Um, how many drafts did it take you to get there or was that, or was that just an explosion of sorts for you? Mm. Yeah, don't ask that one. That one was a gift. <laughs> that mm -hmm. was the first piece I wrote for the collection and I, um, it's a lie to say it came easily because it took years of, being a writer to let it come, but the drafts itself did come almost whole. But what's useful here is, first of all, that rarely happens. And second of all, the last line, which you're, um, you're right to pick up on, I heard that first. And that I think is where the emotional center of the piece is. And so once I had that, I knew I just had to write toward it. I just had to write my way. I just had to make that sentence true. And once I knew that, um, I, I guess you could say it was even, um, I felt a little more confident in taking the leap. Thank you. Thanks, Bruce. You're muted, Jennifer. Yeah, sorry, Roy, please go ahead. Katie, uh, I do some consulting for uh, YA Press because I'm a publisher. And there's a debate that goes on in YA publishing about women writing about men. And it has gotten rather complicated and interesting. But I'm wondering why you chose to write about men when that's more complicated in a lot of publishing circles than it might seem? So the question for me really is why did I choose to write about Nathan Miller? Yes. <laughs> because the fact that he's a man is actually a sentence that never appears in the book. So it's not, is he man enough? It's, is he Nathan Miller enough? Is he a full, fully created character? Um, what you're talking about, Roy, as far as I can tell, is sort of also this broader question of um, the right to write. So, um, I mean, this is like an entire semester long conversation. Um, yes. so I'm gonna try and be really brief. Roxana Robinson said it best when she said that empathy is the opposite of exploitation. Okay, so, or um, uh, Jack Driscoll again, the impulse to write is nothing other than the impulse to love. So when um, an artist in any medium is motivated by curiosity, precision, and maybe they have a measure of discipline, um, obsessiveness, when these things guide the way, as opposed to um, being guided by fears about what one can and can't do, the question of uh, the right to write vanishes. Hmm. That's the super, uh, the super short answer. I mean, another way to look at it is like, Philip Levine said Shakespeare wrote about kings, but he wasn't the king. Or um, Katie Schultz said J.K. Rowling wrote about Hogwarts, but she never, you know, never played Quidditch. Like, <laughs> um, it, 
which is not to not to um, fail to look at like the fact that I am giving voice to a 17 year old Afghan woman. And there are a lot of 17 year old Afghan women who are not given a voice. Okay, so it's not to not answer that, but it is to say, here is where my, um, here's where my loyalty lies. And um, I'm gonna just be, I'm gonna swear, I guess I already did that, but Colson Whitehead, if you're familiar with him, uh, I'll contextualize it in his, one of his keynote addresses for the AWP. He's a, a black author addressing a predominantly white audience. He said, you know, you, basically you can write anything you want, but do not fuck it up. Quote, do not fuck it up. And you have to write bad, bad, bad. You have to get it wrong in the privacy of your own drafts and then get it right. I took that a little bit bigger <laughs> but, uh, than, than what you asked, but um, yeah, I mean, it's a thing. I'm in a male dominated industry writing about a male dominated field and Boy, let me tell you, I'm mostly presented with other men, which was fine, but uh, had its own interesting moments. Um, and then I'm a civilian, so there was that. But by and large, what I experienced 90% of the time was grace and acceptance from male authors, male military authors, right. male readers. I think this came up in a conference because she did fuck it up. She wrote about a 14 year old boy and got it wrong. And the book is a big bestseller and I won't name names, but that was partly why that conversation was going on in that publishing conference. Um, and all the men knew it. Uh, and she got confronted with it. And she just said, I can write about 14 year old boys. And that was kind of her rationale for it. So I'm always curious about it now, although I'm a nonfiction publisher and have been for 40 years, uh, I'm thinking about some fiction for my press and I wanna know about those kinds of conversations. Mm. Good, thank you. Thank you, Roy. Go ahead. Oh, hi. Uh, thanks for uh, sharing those works. Um, my question is actually about the process that you found. So I found myself kind of having that urge to write that you were talking about, but uh, you know, what then? I mean, how do you kind of like find your way into the profession of being a writer as opposed to just doing it? When you say what then, do you mean how to begin with that first sentence or do you mean um, no, more, more like how did you make it into a, I don't know, into a job, you know? I mean, how did you, uh, how did you kind of get, get there? You know, was it just yeah. pure luck or was it, you know, were there steps that you took? Mm. Um, mm. <laughs> so part of it depends on what job means to you. Um, it's helpful at a certain point to know whether you want to be a part of academia at the college or graduate level or teaching creative writing in a, even a high school. So that's, that's helpful. Teaching is one of the more common jobs for writers. Um, I have a job, but I'm my own boss. It's the best job ever. I work 25 hours a week, maybe 20. Um, but it took a lot of few years of freelancing and writing for newspapers. I did decide to go to graduate school. I graduated in 2009 at the height of the Great Recession when having an MFA was the equivalent of graduating first grade. Um, so I had to find a new way. And I feel like right now in, in particular, we are bridging economies. Capitalism isn't serving a lot of people. And in particular, it's not serving artists. It hasn't served them for a very long time. So um, I can't be too terribly specific, but 
other than to say, you know, gut check with like, what are your goals? What are your goals? To earn just enough to buy yourself time to write, to stand in front of audiences and teach and offer, to get paid to speak, to be your own boss. You know, there's a whole spectrum and sort of experiment within that and then double down when you have some, when it feels right. Thank you. Thank you. Mike, would you like to go? Sure. Thank you for, boy, I've got an echo here. <laughs> Thank you for uh, uh, appearing here and reading your work. It was um, very fascinating and, and just uh, totally illuminating to hear what your perspective and process were. And um, even though my picture just appeared a few minutes ago, I was actually watching on my phone for the, for the, uh, the rest of the thing. Now, I just, a couple comments. And I've got to, uh, here we go, that's better. Um, as a person who owns a number of art galleries, I would say this regarding the men writing women and so forth. Jackson Pollock was not a, drip, a bunch of drips on a canvas, but he did a fantastic job of making those and coming up with something totally original. If people only wrote about what they themselves were, you would not get new perspectives and things outside the box for people to see something new. And um, so I think it's very important that people write exactly what they feel. And I applaud you, uh, Katie, for doing that. And uh, I, just, I just think that's a, uh, it's a fantastic uh, point of view and one that's not always uh, widespread. And um, thank you for doing it that way. Thank you, Mike, that's very kind of you. Experience is not the only teacher, thank goodness. Hi, Katie. I Hi, wanna say Katie. it's lovely to see you and I really appreciate you sharing stories. Um, and I have a two-part question. Um, as you alluded to in talking about how long it takes from the time you're actually deeply working on something to when it's then published and out in the world. Um, clearly the selections you read tonight are things that you wrote many years ago. So part one of the question is, what are you writing now that you're excited about? Um, and part two is given your interest in language and how words can shift meanings and be twisted almost overnight. Um, are there words today that are kind of catching your attention and sending you down new rabbit holes? What an amazing question. Thank you. Generous question. Um, yeah, I'm working. I have a collection of short stories. They're set in Appalachia. I've got maybe like 120 pages or so. And then I have this other story that's like 80 pages or so. So it wants to be that other thing, that N-O-V-E-L, which I'm not going to say because I know how treacherous it is to write them but I'm definitely working on that. Um, and that is also set in Appalachia. Um, actually, part of it was just published in the Missouri Review and it's online, it's called Wait For Me, it just came out like last week. Um, so it's not about war. <laughs> I took a break from writing about war when I was pregnant um, and then kind of had to come back and do a few more versions of the novel. And then when that was done, I was, done. Um, so what persists for me and even in these other pieces is still there is place-based for lack of a better word place-based writing. So plot to me and character to me come out of landscape um, and I've been living in Appalachia for 17 years now so I'm finally able to really write about it. Um, and 
also since having a child, I've had to change my process. So whereas before, like I might find a hook with that word and then research the word or the word as it appears in different contexts, I don't have time to research anymore. So I, I had to, like, I had a lot of false starts after River was first born. I, I would start in and in my sort of way, even though they were Appalachian stories, not war stories, but, but then I had to like research mining and mountaintop removal and all that. And I didn't have time. So I had to pivot. And um, I don't think, I don't think it's word-based, but I'm still too in it to name it yet. Other than to tell you that there's definitely something there with land, landscape. Thanks for, I'm gonna be thinking about that for a while. Thanks, Megan. Bill, go ahead. Uh, Katie, is it true that you have vowed to never write about your parents? <laughs> uh, can you make a public statement oh, so today <laughs> in front of these witnesses? Oh, this is my father who at my first reading was the first question in the audience. And he said, um, is it true that your father is your greatest influence? So, <laughs> oh, I'm not gonna answer oh, that question, Dad. <laughs> He's frozen. Influence of a uh, decent upbringing. I only caught part of that. Stephen has a question. Hi, Katie. Uh, thank you for uh, the readings and for this session and um, for making this open. Uh, I, I want to, I guess, focus on today being Veterans Day. Thank you. And I'm sure that that's not a coincidence um, that the session is being held on, on Veterans Day. And you mentioned in your talk that uh, you had done a lot of research and you had gone to a, an Air Force base and um, really understood um, what military authors had written about. And here we are, you know, 19 years into the war on terror. And um, I'm, so I guess I've got uh, two questions. Um, one is, you know, what are you thinking and feeling uh, today? I mean, setting aside uh, politics, if you can, just, uh, thinking in terms of empathy about our soldiers and our veterans um, who've been prosecuting this war and some who've really suffered because of it. And then secondly, um, just if you couldn't suggest any titles or authors that you've come across uh, in doing your research, uh, military authors, or maybe even authors who don't classify themselves as military authors, but whose work has really spoken to you about where we are um, it, as a country, uh, again, not politically, but so much emotionally, um, which I think your your words and sort of the, the rhythm of your language captures. Uh, uh, sorry for the long question. That's okay, great questions. Um, I think what I can tell you about empathy on Veterans Day is illustrated, I'll try to be brief, by three different points. The first one is this, and it's embarrassing, but I'm gonna share it. You know, when I first started doing this work, I had a lot of questions, unanswered questions about the wars. One of those questions was as basic as why would someone join? Why would someone serve? So I have been privileged and cushioned enough to not really even have an answer to that myself. And boy, did I, boy, did I find a lot of reasons why someone would throughout my research. And then, like I said, I didn't know any veterans. And then after the first book came out, like, wow, I was just welcomed into this amazing family. <laughs> amazing. So empathy there on a personal level really has to do with just, it's never simple. It is never simple. Someone else's experience or reasons for joining or experience of war. And so the, uh, it's just gray. It is gray, gray, gray. And so um, I just always try and keep that close to my heart and really it ends up 
meaning I can have more authentic conversations with people. Um, I guess there were three, weren't there? Um, <laughs> I don't know where the other two went. Maybe they'll come back. And your question about, oh, here's here it is. Um, also sensitivity. So I had to rely, I did have to, um, I didn't interview soldiers for the first book. Uh, I didn't really ever formally interview any soldiers or veterans, but through meeting veterans on tour for the first book, I made so many great connections, so many kind hearted men and women um, where I reached the point where I could like text a question about IEDs to, to an author who was also a veteran or like email there, you know, I like, I had to have a very, sensitive conversation about a veteran about like like if a soldier steps on the IED here like will his body break apart at the waist or at the neck like I had to have that conversation and it was a number of years ago and it was actually right around Veterans Day and we just both of us sort of knew, like we just kind of didn't talk about it for like 10 days. Like there was just this cushion around the day because he had answers to that question, but he had answers because he'd seen it. Um, so sensitivity. As far as books, um, you know, Kais Akbar Omar's memoir, A Fort of Nine Towers is incredible. It just shows things that I've never seen, but it is so hard. I had to put it down several times, but it's amazing. Um, all of Sebastian Younger's work, creative nonfiction. Um, uh, the Good Soldier is also incredible in terms of the pressure, the unending pressure just like squished that um, men and women serving can feel. The Lonely Soldier by Helen Benedict. She's a professor at Columbia University. She is also one of like, I mean, I've found like six women who are civilians, American female civilian authors writing about these wars. And we have stuck together like glue because we can get cornered in some of the same ways. And so we've helped each other. And Helen has really helped me the biggest way that she helped me was once to buy me a double shot of bourbon after a really intense panel in Seattle and say, your career doesn't have to look like theirs. And I mean, it was a godsend. So I'm thinking of the young man who asked about um, how do you get a job as a writer? Uh, having friends like that can really help and understanding that you get to make your own career. Uh, some other books. So Helen Bendix, The Lonely Soldier. Um, Saima Wahab, In My Father's House. She is an Afghan-American woman. And then just currently, you can always follow the work of Bilal Sawari, who is a BBC reporter, um, Afghan, born and raised, came over on a scholarship in 2001 to attend Middlebury College for four years in Vermont and then went right back and started reporting. His work is phenomenal. Thank you very much. Greg Bidwell, you've had your hand up for quite a while. Uh, hi, um, the, each of the three characters that meet on the road are, are somewhat, um, I think are sympathetic um, even um, the, the fellow working for the uh, Taliban went through, seems to be, uh, went through pretty rough uh, time of it um, earlier. Um, I'm wondering, were you tempted to uh, uh, use, put your voice into a Taliban character directly or somebody who, or maybe the, uh, the sister-in-law of Asaya or uh, that um, it was sort of more of a, a very unsympathetic uh, villain type character. Is that is that something that um, that uh, you were thinking of uh, doing that more in the in the novel? Yeah, thanks for asking, Greg. I did that, and I had to kill my darlings. Um, 
Very because good. it was a cheat. It was a plot cheat. So, you know, I had my three characters, most of these drafts, and then at a certain point around draft five, I really, I didn't know how to pull off plot yet. I, the dots were not connecting and I didn't know how to do it. So I thought, oh, well, I'll just character hop, you know, and I wrote these different flashes, which were very soothing to write because I can do it and I enjoy it. There were like these little jolts and one was from the Taliban and one was from Shanaz and one was from the orphan and all the, I peppered them throughout. And it was just how I got to like move all the parts around. And um, I have a friend, Abigail DeWitt, who's also a fabulous author. She perpetually writes about World War II. Um, I recommend her work as well. And we trade, like we read everything by each other. And she's much older and wiser and has 18 million books, unlike me. And um, she just said, you know, oh, oh Katie, <laughs> okay, you can't. You know, and she helped me see why, but that was great because I could have spent years sort of eddying and I just kicked them all out and fixed it. <laughs> it makes it makes sense. Yeah. It's, um... It was very alluring to write up. I mean, those, I will say there's these amazing, you can still find it, interviews with Taliban soldiers on the BBC website. Footage that is, will never be gotten again and has, uh, but I mean, you're literally just like there in a tent with a Taliban soldier, hearing them speak and repeat, um, for lack of a better way of putting it, it's evident that there's just at least the subjects that were featured in these videos, the brainwashing, the level of repetition of phrases and sentences that kind of didn't even logically add up was just astounding and it was very attractive to me to try and write about that because there was a rhythm there and an oddity there and I wanted to find um, the autonomy in, in in that kind of voice but that that's a different story. Okay. Thank you. Jamie you had your hand up would you like to talk to Katie? Sure. Hi, Katie. Thank you so much for this. This has been really interesting, not only the stories, but also just hearing about your process and kind of what you've gone through. Um, I love the idea of the flash stories. I'm looking forward to reading that because I haven't, I haven't read any of your books, but um, I think it's fascinating to explore things, especially things that aren't your own personal experience. And so my question is really about your process when it comes to reviewing your work. You mentioned you have this group of women authors who um, are kind of in a similar position. And I'm just wondering um, who you have review your work, both just in terms of tone and, and style and, and how that works for you. Yeah, um, that core group of women authors, we really kind of help each other just more professionally out on the circuit, if you will more moral support. Um, we don't trade pages, but really it's just Abigail. <laughs> Abigail DeWitt and I, I read, you know, I do read my work out loud to my husband and my parents are kind enough to read early drafts when I will let them. <laughs> um, that's less about line level than it is like, what question did you have? What feeling are you left with kind of? were you persuaded type of work, but Abigail DeWitt and I um, will really hone in on bigger plot moves, um, believability. So I have this tendency, I think probably because I, uh, Flash is like my powerhouse, my comfortable place. I have this tendency to know what's true, like while the rest of America's at the mall before I've like shown how it's true on the page. And um, that's very hard to see when you're doing that in your own work. So, but Abigail can see it. She knows when I'm doing it and all she has to do is point to the line and ask a question. And that's all I need to, to go back and revise. Thank you. Brenna. Hi. Hi. So I was having some technical difficulties. So I actually missed 
a good part of this, but I'm glad that it was that it's being recorded so that I can go back and listen to things later. So sorry if this is already something that you've gone over, but I heard you mention that um, you uh, had an interesting time trying to navigate all of the different connections between these different characters and their voices. And so I wanted to know more about that because I think that that uh, approach to fiction is really uh, fascinating, but it, sometimes it can feel really hectic and spread out. And when it's done poorly, but when it's done well, it can really, um, uh, can really elevate the piece. So I wanted to hear what, uh, how you tried to navigate and orchestrate all of those different moving parts. Yeah, thank you for that, Rana. Um, it, I think a lot of it comes down to landscape for me. So each, I knew immediately kind of just because of how I am in the world that like each character had their own unique relationship to the desert and was always in reaction to place, always. And so that kept me honest because the way that a 17 year old Afghan girl under a burqa is gonna feel walking in the desert, it's really different than a displaced Indiana soldier, exhausted, doesn't like Appalachia, isn't sure what he likes anymore, wearing 55 pounds of battle rattle, dehydrated with a migraine is gonna feel compared to a reluctant, you know, Taliban sort of contract worker um, who is used to spending his days alone making bricks and is now, you know, wielding an AK. So even just to take those three on a walk would show me so much. Um, Rahim, for some reason, I knew very early on that he was um, tender and, uh, had this poetic side. So that informs his language. We, we didn't hear from him tonight, but that informs my word choice, the way um, that his narrative leans into metaphor. Um, I really, I did not want to write an, an abusive relationship, but I had to, and I wanted to write a realistic one. And this is a 17 year old who was basically given off to a prearranged marriage you know, to a 40 year old distant cousin. So there are a lot of ways in which that could have been awkward, but their relationship is actually has some, I, I was able to surprise myself, which was important to me. Uh, with the soldiers in terms of language, it's just so much of it is about worldview. So, um, If you've grown up with war, you might look at the night sky and see a shooting star and have one reaction. And if you've, and if you've never seen war in your life, you might look up at the night sky and see a shooting star and have a totally different reaction. One could send you into terror, the other could provoke you to make a witch. <laughs> so. Thank you, that was really helpful. Well said. Good. Good. Okay, any last thoughts or questions? Katie, do you have anything you'd like to say? Just thank you <laughs> for coming and to see these friendly faces and names is also really special. And, um, um, you know, I'm seeing a few witties here who like traveled to my book launch, you know? Mm -hmm. And um, it just never, it never goes away really all the way, so. Thanks for being here today. And I hope what I shared too about being a philosophy major was useful. Like I said, I don't get to speak about that very much. Um, but reach out to me, those of you that are writers, especially I welcome communication and emails. I really enjoy the deep conversation. <clears throat> Fantastic. I really enjoyed um, when we very first started this conversation, um, spending some time on your website where you talk about things like why this war was interesting to you and why you really wanted to know more about it. And it just, uh, it gives a little extra dimension. <laughs> highly recommend a visit to there. Oh, thank you. Yeah, there's some old Whitman rugby pictures on there too. Um, yeah. Kind of connecting that sort of ecstatic, insane high of 
doing what you do when you play women college rugby and connecting that ecstatic moment with um, that leap we the leaps you have to take as a writer so you can geek out there if that's interesting to you thank <laughs> you all again you've been so gracious that's your great time. all right thank you everyone and uh as uh Brenna mentioned this has been recorded and will be on the Whitman College uh, alumni page. We have a virtual Whitman site with a lot of different uh, recordings and uh, some materials that are interesting, entertaining, and uh, if you really need something to do stuck at home, it's a great place to explore. Uh, thank you very much. And thanks so much to Katie for taking time to do this and interrupting bedtime uh, uh -huh. to make it happen. Uh -huh. So good night, everyone. Thank you. Take care.